So the first speaker up this morning is Michael Sheridan. I was very fortunate to see his lecture in the SCAA symposium this year, which was, for me, uh, exceptionally good. Um, I've also been uh, fortunate enough to be able to taste some of the sensory trials that he has done with the Casablo and Katura, trying to differentiate, if there is, see if there's a difference between Katura and Castillo. Uh, Michael has led the pro coffee programming for the Catholic, Catholic Relief Services since 2004 and he currently leads the Borderlands Coffee Project in Colombia which has the staging ground for the Colombian Century, Century Trial. He also directs the Coffee Lands program which coordinates CRS coffee prog programming worldwide. I don't know that. And he lives in uh, Ecuador, right? Correct. Uh, with his wife and a pug, whatever that is. Uh, where he also writes his blog, which you really should follow. It's super, super interesting uh, if you're interested in, in coffee origin and the, the sort of uh, challenges that uh, you can have there as a partner. It's called coffeelands.crs.org. You probably put the link on the website. Yes, so without further ado, Michael Sherry. Thank you, Tim. Before we start, I'd like to ask um, all of you to help me with something very important. Would you all um, be in my selfie? Yes. <laughs> okay, everyone say Nordic Roaster Forum. Nordic Roaster Forum. Nordic Roaster Forum. Great, thank you. <laughs> the Department of Nariño in southern Colombia is a very important source of a very important agricultural product. It is a high value product that can fetch high prices for the farmers who grow it. It's a product in high demand among consumers in the marketplace who value it for its properties as a stimulant. It is traded on a vast and complex global commercial network that links far-flung communities in the global south with affluent consumers in the global north. And in Nariño, in recent years, it's been the focus of a massive campaign of crop substitution. I'm talking, of course, about coffee. You probably thought I was going to say coca. The truth is that Nariño does have a bit of a coca problem. For nine straight years, it's been the number one coca-producing department and the number one coca-producing country in the world. And in recent years, Coca production in Nariño has increased year on year despite the firm commitment of Colombia's government to a policy of coca eradication, a policy it pursues by brute force and by means of persuasion. What does uh, coca eradication by force look like? It looks like this. The men in the center of the photo with the green shirts are members of the Colombian army and they move from village to village across Nariño with manual eradication teams, the men in the blue shirts who tear coca plants out by their roots. What does uh, coca substitution by persuasion look like? Well, it involves government programs that create financial incentives for growers to replace coca with licit crops, mostly coffee. But coffee in Nariño has also been undergoing a massive campaign of crop substitution in recent years. You can't see that sign, but it says Cafe Catura. And over the last five, six, seven years, tens of thousands of smallholder growers across Nariño have uprooted the Katura plants that have been the lifeblood of Nariño's coffee culture for generations to replace them with Castillo. Like the financial incentives that growers receive to switch from coca to coffee, they also receive financial incentives to switch from Katura to the new hybrid Castillo. Colombia's coffee renovation loan is nothing short of exemplary. Its seven-year term is ideal for perennial crops like coffee that take four to five years to reach full productivity. Its annual interest rate is low. Its two-year um, grace period gives growers a little bit of breathing room as the coffee begins to produce cherry and income. But the most important data point related to Colombia's coffee loan is this one, a 40% subsidy from the federal government. Coffee growers in Colombia get free money to plant coffee, but this deal is only available to growers who plant Castillo, and it has been a vitally important aspect of the country's process of crop substitution and 
uh, in the process of adoption of what is still a relatively new technology in Colombia. In 2012, we surveyed more than 500 smallholder growers across eight coffee growing municipalities in Nariño. We asked them, the last time you planted coffee, what variety did you plant? More than half said Castillo, fewer than a quarter said Katura. We also asked them what variety they plant the next time they plant coffee. The proportion of growers who answered Katura declined from almost one in four to fewer than one in six. And while the percentage of growers who answered Castillo declined slightly, the overall proportion of growers who named resistant varieties Castillo and uh, Colombia increased from just under three and four to more than four and five. In, in, in places like Nariño, in Colombia, um, it's possible that Katura's best days are behind it. And it's important to say that while the, the uh, coffee institutions of Colombia do not have an explicit strategy of Katura eradication, the way that the government has an explicit strategy of coca eradication, the irony is that in Nariño that the government's intentional eradication strategy is failing and its accidental eradication policy, eradication cultura, is succeeding. Nariño is one of those origins that everybody in coffee knows, but I feel like very few people in coffee know really well. I've had the great good fortune personally to get to know Nariño a little bit over the last four to five years through my involvement in the CRS Coffee Lands program. And uh, I've gotten to know it in two different ways. I got to know it in the way that anybody gets to know a new origin. Traveling there a lot, talking to growers, talking to exporters, talking to everybody who has anything to do with the coffee trade, and really beginning to understand. But I've also gotten to know it in a different way, which is through a research partnership that we have with the International Center for Tropical Agriculture, also known as SEAP, to do uh, detailed research related to our field operations. So we've done uh, we did a detailed baseline in 2012 that had three aspects, a household level survey, a uh, sensory baseline, and uh, an analysis of Nariño's coffee sector. I didn't need to do all that fancy study though to understand what was very clear from my first uh, visits back in 2011, and that is that Nariño's coffee sector is a classic oligopsony. What does that mean? That's just a fancy economics term to say that a very small number of buyers have cornered the market on Nariño coffee. The truth is that almost all of Nariño's coffee ends up in the hands of two guys. This guy, or the company that he represents, who buys it from this guy, to put in this product. And what those two guys don't get their hands on tends to go to this guy, who puts it in this product. Starbucks put Nariño on the map more than 20 years ago when it started sourcing and selling single origin uh, Colombia Nariño Supremo coffee. Since then it has dropped the Supremo from the product title, but it has not dropped Nariño from its lineup. It continues to be a very important source for the company. A few years ago when it uh, put together its 40th anniversary tribute blend, it built it around uh, the core ingredient of its Nariño single origin as a, as a sort of testament to the importance of Nariño to the past, present, and future of the company. So if Starbucks invented the second wave of coffee, then I, I think you could say that Nariño is a, is a quintessential second wave origin. It produces massive volumes of homogenized specialty grade coffee for two of the world's greatest uh, and leading specialty coffee brands. Our research from Seattle told us that Starbucks and Espresso together source 98%, over 98% of Nariño's coffees. That means that less than 2% of the coffees are sourced in ways that would be familiar to people in this room through small, fully traceable lots, highly differentiated on the basis of their, of their quality, and sourced directly. I should say that this is an arrangement that works really well for pretty much everyone in Nariño most of the time. It obviously works for Nespresso and Starbucks because they get huge volumes of coffee that are, that's really good. Um, it works for their exporters. But it also tends to work pretty well for growers. Um, on top of the high price for Colombian milds, Nariño coffees command an internal premium uh, within Colombia. And the competition between Espresso and Starbucks tends to exert uh, upward pressure on the price there uh, and further benefit to the growers, which is incidentally the opposite of what happens in most oligopsonies, which is collusion between the small number of buyers to drive down prices. 
When you add to that the fact that both Nespresso and Starbucks pay their exporters to deliver agronomic extension services to growers in their supply chains, you understand why growers in Nariño are the envy of many of their peers in other places uh, in the coffee lands. But the, we, we were asked in our project to make lasting and positive contributions to Nariño's coffee culture. When we got a really good look at what was happening, it was hard for us to understand as a Catholic agency with no previous work in Nariño's coffee sector and only five years of funding, how we could do that. Uh, because things seem to be working pretty well. So we started to focus our attention on the other 2% of the market. We conducted a coffee quality baseline. So out of more than 1,500 farms participating in our project, we randomly selected 65. We sampled the coffee and sent it to friends and allies in the U.S. marketplace and asked them to help us evaluate it. These were randomly selected farms that had never gotten any previous training from us on coffee quality or quality control and the, there were late harvest samples. We almost didn't get to the farms in time to get them. So we were not, uh, this wasn't the cream of the crop that we weren't trying to put our best foot forward. We were just trying to get a really honest and representative sense of what quality was out there. The average score was 82.4, but there were 32 results of 85 points and over, and a high score of 89.5. There were 89s, 88.5s, 88s, 87.5s, 87s. There were a lot of good coffees out there. But our baseline survey also told us that only 4% of growers in the region reported ever having received premiums for quality. We read this as clear evidence of a market failure in the region. We had farmers capable of producing exceptional high quality lots, unable to connect in the marketplace with the buyers who were seeking quality differentiated copies and willing to pay price premiums for them. It gave us a very clear direction to pursue with our project. We weren't going to go and try to improve on what the Federation and Espresso or Bull Cafe and Starbucks were doing around high volume specialty coffee. We were going to try to focus on this 2% and how to build the kinds of systems that would allow more of this quali exceptional quality differentiated coffee to flow to buyers like you in the marketplace who are seeking it. There was only one problem. The variety that the marketplace told us it preferred for the quality differentiated segment of the market was disappearing from Nariño. It's not that, that, by, that growers didn't get the signals coming from that segment of the marketplace to say that it preferred Ketura. They did understand that. When we surveyed growers about their varietal preferences, we asked the ones who told us they were going to stick with Ketura why they made that choice. And the second most common answer they gave us was cup quality. It was an answer that did not register at all among the growers who told us they were going to play Castillo. So farmers got it. Couture to them meant quality. But in 2012, when we collected these data, farmers in Arena were worried about more than just producing coffee quality. They were like worried about producing any coffee at all. Uh, Nariño was not spared uh, from the ravages of coffee leaf rust that started affecting Colombia in 2008. By 2012, more than 60% were still struggling to control it on their farms. And they saw Castillo as an important part of their strategy for responding to coffee leaf rust. As you can see here, the overwhelming single uh, most important answer, most important reason why farmers were choosing Castillo was the resistance it offered from coffee leaf rust. And this is an appropriate and understandable posture for farmers who have very little margin for error. Our baseline survey also told us that the average farm in Nariño has less than one hectare planted in coffee. Growers are mostly poor mostly struggling with hunger, sometimes for extended periods every year. And the decision they make about what variety they'll plant will affect them and their families for 10 to 15 years. It was not a decision that growers were taking lightly, and it was not a decision that we were taking lightly. We had money in our budget to promote farm renovation, and we needed to make a decision on what varieties we would promote. And we knew that this decision was fraught with moral hazard. What does that mean? It's another fancy economics term to describe a situation which I convince you to start adopting risky behaviors, even though you bear all the risk and I have the potential for reward. We did not want to push farmers on the margins into more risky behaviors without really understanding that there was a high likelihood of a positive return for their investment in Katura. So we went back again to try to understand better the arguments for and against Castillo, starting with the argument in the marketplace. You may remember in 2010 with a cup of excellence, 
there was a bit of a controversy around the varieties uh, involved in the in the cup of excellence, uh, the winning cup of excellence lots. And when we tried to understand the arguments in the marketplace against Castillo, we realized there was a small number of loud voices um, protesting against Castillo. We found that a lot of that, of the noisiest voices, were people who were arguing not on the basis of data or on facts, but on the basis of ideology, and on the basis of the very seductive idea that anything that is produced in a breeding lab can't possibly be as good as something that's produced in nature. Uh, again, it was a decision based more on faith and that idea of traditional varieties that reason in many cases. There were a lot of uh, people in the marketplace we talked to who had uh, fairly well-founded ideas, but even the people who had cut tons and tons of samples of Ventura and of Castillo, we weren't convinced that they had cut them in a way that controlled for variability in environment and management. What do I mean? I mean, we weren't sure that, growers, that buyers who said they didn't like Castillo were really able to contribute, uh, attribute in any reliable way what they didn't like about the coffee to the genetics. Maybe it was that these were low-grown or poorly managed or had poor fertilization or poor soils or poor harvesting or poor processing. So we, we mostly rejected the argument in the marketplace against Castillo. What about the arguments for Castillo? This was one of the seminal studies released by Sandy Cafe to back up its claims that, Couture, that Castillo had as good a cup quality as traditional varieties. Um, and a few excerpts from the abstract will show why we also ultimately, con todo respeto a la institucionalidad cafetera of Colombia, why we also uh, rejected these arguments. What did the study set out to do? The objective of the study was to show that Castillo had similar cup attributes to traditional varieties including Bourbon, Captura, and Tipica. In my mind, research whose outcome is preordained is not research, and it's too easily dismissed by critics as propaganda. So we struggled uh, just with the objective of the research. Who conducted the research? The tasting panel of the Qualities Office of the National Coffee Growers Federation. I've worked with some of these people, and I find them to be exceptional coffee professionals, committed, hardworking, excellent at their craft. I trust their work, but again, in the context in which people are set out to be uh, potentially opposed to a hybrid variety, the re exclusive reliance on internal folks uh, created a situation in which there was, a, there was a sense that the Federation was being judge and jury. It was judging the variety that it itself had created and had incentives to judge it favorably. How did they do it? They started with 10 organoleptic categories, 0 to 10 scale in each of the 10 organoleptic categories, 0 to 100 scale. So far, it's familiar. Then things start to get really crazy. Instead of just averaging up each of the four or five cultivars that they have evaluated, they created these quality tiers. Anything from five points and up on a zero to 10 scale was standard quality. Anything from six to 10 up was good quality. And then instead of just, again, giving us the averages and showing where each of the cultivars came down in terms of scores, they talked about the frequency with which each cultivar was placed into one of those categories. It's kind of a, an unusual approach that doesn't resonate with most of the ways that, that people in the room judge coffee. Again, calling into question the results. What did they find? They found that Castillo had similar cup attributes to the traditional cultivars it uses controls and that they couldn't be distinguished. The study set out, in other words, the study found, in other words, precisely what it set out to find. So, having rejected both of those, we resolved to evaluate the samples ourselves. The Columbia Sensory Trial was really designed just to generate good, independent information on the quality of these two varieties that could inform decision making. Generate information that was generated through a rigorous scientific process. We wanted to inform ourselves and the decisions we made about what varieties we promoted through our project but we also wanted to contribute to better decision making at three levels. On the farm, where our friend Tim Schilling from World Coffee Research says farmers just want to know what variety will give them the best bang for their buck. In the policy making process, where the policies of Columbia's coffee institutions contributed to what one buyer calls the single largest flavor profile shift that the country has ever made in such a short period of time. And in the marketplace, where there was in some segments of the specialty market, noisy opposition to Castillo, but opposition that we felt was not well-founded. 
We continue to work with SEAT, the International Center for Tropical Agriculture. We've built new research partnerships with World Coffee Research and Kansas State University. Really, the design of the trial was built around this framework, G by E by M, genotype or genetics by environment by management. These categories of variables explain just about every important outcome on the farm, including, but not limited to, cup quality. What we were trying to do was to isolate the impacts of G, or genetics, on cup quality by controlling for variability in environmental and management variables. What do I mean? Well, we selected coffee from farms that were growing Castilla and Ketura. Out of the three sets of variables, that's the only thing that varied. One sample was Castillo, one sample was Ketura. We chose them from farms growing both varieties in identical agroecological conditions. That is to say, in a field trial of this nature, this was not done in a varietal garden under totally controlled conditions. This was done on real farms with real coffee grown by real growers who bring coffee to the market. This is a coffee you would encounter in the marketplace if somebody would bring you coffee and say, this is my Castillo, this is my Cotura. Under those conditions, we did, we thought, a pretty good job of controlling for variability in in uh, agroecological conditions. Similarly, we ma uh, monitored the process to ensure that the management, uh, harvesting, and post-harvest processes were the same for both varieties. So that the variability in taste that people were tasting was not due to differences in management or differences in harvesting, due to differences in genetics. For each of the uh, samples we collected, we collected uh, data on all of these variables and others. And we subjected those samples to two different processes of evaluation. The first were traditional cup cupping panels using the Q protocol. Um, it is a standard you're all familiar with, and it is uh, what I would call a vertical logic. 87 is better than 84 is better than 81. The objective of this part of the exercise was, determined, was to try to determine whether one variety was clearly better than another. We also subjected them to analysis using the World Coffee Research uh, coffee lexicon, the sensory lexicon. It was the first time this lexicon was ever applied in a research setting to real samples. And I would say that the logic that was applied there was a horizontal logic. They were not applying value judgments. They were not trying to determine which coffee was better, which variety was better. They were trying to determine in very explicit ways and in very uh, quantifiable ways whether those coffees were different and how. So these are four companies that were that have been working with us in Nariño to try to make uh, a second wave origin easier to navigate for the third wave of coffee. Um, we started inviting uh, these folks to the table for the sensory trial. We added representatives from two of the leading supply chains in Nariño, and we also added pioneers from the U.S. specialty market: George Howell Coffee and Red Fox Coffee Merchants, which is the new importer uh, run by Aleko Shigunis previously uh, with Stumptown and Coffee Shrub. These are the eight cuppers who were involved in our sensory analysis. You may recognize some of them, uh, even if you don't recognize others, they all play important roles in the buying processes and grading processes in their companies, their QC directors, their green buyers, their heads of quality control. In the lab, we knew we had to do two repetitions of each sample uh, in order to generate some statistical power and to make sure that what the scores were reliable. We didn't want to ask people to do more than 40 samples a day to avoid fatigue. We decided to do two panels because there was some uh, noise in the marketplace about the idea that Castillo doesn't uh, hold up as well in storage. So we did one panel in October of 2014 and another in January of 2015. And we realized this slide with very important cuppers who were recognized in industry as sensory experts but who were also very important to their respective companies. That was great for the project, it gave it a lot of credibility, but it was really bad for the design because we couldn't get those people uh, to contribute their free labor for more than three days at a time. And that ended up being the principal constraint on the research design. Knowing that we could have them for only three days, that we had to have two repetitions, two panels, 40 samples a day, we couldn't involve more than 25 farms in the survey, even though we had over 100 farms that were growing uh, both varieties and were eligible for the trial. We actually eliminated three of those farms due to defects in the samples, so we had a sample size of just 22 farms. And that ends up being a real uh, constraint on the, on the project because with a sample size that small, we didn't generate the kind of statistical power we had hoped, 
and we can't really generalize too much on the basis of these results. So that's something to keep in mind as we look at the results. What were the results? Um, Intelligentsia hosted the cupping panels at its uh, roasting works in Chicago. We had two panels, two repetitions per sample per panel, 22 samples of Castillo, 22 samples of Petura, eight cuppers, over a thousand data points. And when we totaled them up and averaged them out, both coffees scored just about 83 points. Round one, October 2014, went to Katura by one one hundredth of a point on average. That's the mean score highlighted there. Round two went to uh, Katura, oh, sorry, round one went to Castillo by one one hundredth of a point. Round two to Katura by half a point. On average, Katura had a score that was three tenths of a point higher than Castillo. But those scores were not statistically significant. The difference was not statistically significant. So there was no evidence that one variety was better than another in average scores. You'll recall that we did two panels to see whether one variety did better than the other in storage. What we see here is that Castillo declined slightly in its average score from October to January. Katura declined also, but less. Uh, actually, no, Katura actually increased its score right by a slight, a slight margin. That would seem to suggest that uh, it validates the idea that Castillo does not do as well as Katura in storage. But again, those results were not statistically significant. So we can't say that this produced any evidence that one variety fades more quickly than the other. We also looked carefully at sensory categories. There was a lot of talk about acidity in the run-up to this trial. Um, people, I think, recognize Castillo has an amazing bright acidity, but there was some question about whether it was multidimensional in the way that uh, people thought of the classic uh, Nariño profile as having uh, having citric acidity, having tartaric and malic acid. Um, but as you can see here, the acidity uh, was a dead heat. There was no advantage for one variety over the other. The slight varieties for fragrance, flavor, and aftertaste, uh, the slight preferences, rather, in fragrance, flavor, and aftertaste for Katura were also not statistically significant. So the, the trial produced no evidence that one coffee was better than another in any particular sensory category. We were mindful of the fact that we had very different kinds of companies participating in this trial. Uh, the companies, whoops, to the right of the dotted line obviously are dealing with massive qualities, uh, dealing in denominating their purchases in dozens of containers, while the folks on the left are happy to denominate their purchases in dozens of bags. Um, and we wondered whether there was a difference between these two categories uh, or these two market channels in their preferences. And again, uh, well, here's what we found. Both channels preferred Katura on average to Castillo. Uh, you can see the specialty companies, as we're calling them just for these purposes, um, gave higher scores across the board. Um, their margin of preference for Katura was narrower than the margin of preference in the high volume specialty category. Uh, but again, the same average, three tenths of one point uh, is not statistically significant, so there's no evidence of any difference in preferences between these two categories. So it's not that the specialty companies, and that is where the loudest voices of opposition to Castillo really came from, that segment of the market. They didn't prefer uh, Couture to Castillo in any statistically significant way. In the end, what this tells us is that those cuppers did not, applying that vertical logic, generate any evidence of vertical separation between the two varieties. One was not better than the other. What happened with the WCR analysis? Well, the folks at World Coffee Research um, worked with Kansas State University's Sensory Analysis Center to develop a sensory lexicon that has 108 variables, 108 sensory variables. And the researchers at Kansas State, for purposes of this research, reduced that number to 36 based on a preliminary analysis of these samples and their prior experience with Colombian coffees. And what they found was a significant degree of overlap in the sensory footprints between the two coffees. All 36 attributes were present in both coffees, just at different intensities. So it wasn't that Castillo presented one set of attributes and Couture another, it's that they both presented the same attributes in different uh, intensities. And how did they break down? Out of those 36, Castillo was more intense than Couture in 27. 
and Keturah was more intense than Castillo in nine. You can see in both cases a mix of, a mix of attributes that we would consider positive and desirable in our coffees and others that we certainly would not. The thing is that most of those differences, again, were statistically insignificant. 23 of the 36 were not statistically significant. That p-value is a statistical term to say we can reject with 95% uh, certainty the idea that the, that the difference was significant. Only 13 of the 36 were differences that were statistically significant. And what that means is that these were significant differences they're narrow but statistically significant differences. So there was no evidence of vertical separation, but there was evidence of horizontal separation. These are different coffees. They're not the same. They may score the same, but they're not the same coffees. They don't create the same sensory experience for consumers. And this is how those 13 broke down across the two varieties. Of the 13 statistically significant differences in the coffees, Castillo was more intense in these, Petura was more intense in those. Both of them had all 36 attributes present. So what does it all mean? First, what doesn't it mean? This was tweeted by someone uh, at the SCA symposium while I was giving my talk, and I think it really underscores the, the importance of what this study doesn't mean. The sample size was small, too small to generate robust, statistically significant results, and the differences themselves, at least on the Q side, on the cupping side, were not statistically significant. So we can't uh, go too far with the results of this survey. It's applicable to Nariño for the 2014 harvest and the specific agroecologies where we collected the samples, nothing more. But it is the first study done of this nature, and so it's worth looking at in some detail. What are the implications of it? I said at the beginning that we um, wanted to contribute to improve decision making at the farm level, at the policy making level, and at the industry level. So what are the implications of the study at those three levels? For Castillo, what is the implication on the farm and in the policy making process? Well, I don't think that anything that came, came out of the study will dissuade people from Castillo on the farm and in the policy making process. What it says is that growers can get significantly more resistance to coffee leaf rust with Castillo without sacrificing in any statistically significant way their likelihood of producing higher cup scores. So why wouldn't we go with Castillo? And the truth is that farmers in Nariño already, already do part Castillo. This is a map of Nariño, the little blue star is Pasto, uh, which is the capital where you will have stayed if you've gone to Nariño. Most of Nariño's coffees come from this region. This is like the Eje Cafetero of Nariño, two out of every three pounds of coffee comes from these municipalities, La Unión, Caminango, San Pablo, San Lorenzo, um, Tablón de Gómez. We don't have data from those areas, but what we can say is that this is the area where the Federation has historically its uh, most significant footprint and likely uh, is probably more, delivering more support of Castillo in these regions. But what we have from the other regions is pretty amazing in terms of what it says about farmers' preference for Castillo. You remember I said that we had money for renovation in our project budget and we were trying to decide <coughs> what varieties to promote. But well, we ultimately adopted a policy of agnosticism, varietal agnosticism. We told farmers we would support them in renovating with any variety they wanted, so they were free to choose, which is not what happens with the Federation, which only supports uh, renovation with Castillo. And even though we gave farmers free reign, most of them chose Castillo. In Boisaco, which is a region from which people in the room are sourcing, many of you know, it's uh, had a, a, its share number, its fair share of uh, Cup of Excellence winners. 82% of growers chose, or 82% of the renovation was done with Castillo. In Chachagui, where the airport is, if you've ever flown into Pasto, also home to some Cup of Excellence winners, 55% prefer Castillo, only 30 Catura. El Tambo is a an exciting municipality with lots of quality potential, very little penetration by specialty buyers, um, relatively little presence of the Federation compared to the other municipalities. It's the area with the lowest preference for Castillo, but it has a significant preference for resistant varieties. La Florida, 62% Petura, 31%, 62% Castillo, 31% Petura. In the West, this is an area that is uh, an important area for coca production, a lot of presence of guerrilla movements, very little direct sourcing from specialty companies. And you can see in Linares, 
Ketura does not have much of a future. No one in Linares is renovating with Ketura to support the Mark Pleasure. Samaniego, another uh, department with lots of coca production, uh, significant uh, problems with wood plumbing, referred to euphemistically as public order. Um, also, a very strong preference for Castillo. So, growers part Castillo. And this recent drought in Nariño has only reinforced that, um, that perception. A grower I talked to two weeks ago in Boisaco said that there were two conditions this year in the terrible drought that Nariño had that helped protect people's coffee. One was shade, the other was having planted with Castillo. So, Castillo is not going anywhere. Growers like it, Federation likes it, policy will continue to support it. The question comes in, in terms of the marketplace. What is the marketplace's readiness to embrace Castillo? Somebody mentioned yesterday George Howell. He's a pioneer in the U.S. specialty movement. Many of you know him. He participated in this trial, cupping samples in his own lab. And when I talked to him beforehand, he said he expected to taste the tail of the devil in the Castillo samples. He said, for me, the signature mark of Castillo is that a really stringent finish ruins an otherwise really pleasant experience. I expect to taste the tail of the devil. I talked to him afterward. He said, I didn't taste it at all. He gave uh, one of the Castillos 91.5 points, called it an elegant coffee. He's not rushing out to buy Castillos. He had a policy of not buying Castillos. And he's not going to change that policy, but he raised his eyebrows and said, I'm going to give this more thought. I'm going to be more open now to Castillos than I was. There's a similar re response from Stumptown, which also uh, had a policy of not buying Castillo prior to this. So, this study is not moving the market to do things it didn't do before, but I think it's given people reason to pause and give Castillo a second look. The other thing that's really encouraging is this. You remember I said that we tried to design the study to isolate the impacts of genetics on cup quality. What we found from both the, the cupping samples, uh, the cupping process, and the Columbia Sensory, uh, the sensory Lexicon is that genetics explain less of the variability in cup scores than environment and management. That, that is to say that a Castillo and a Couture from the same farm tended to taste more alike and score some more similarly than Castillos from different farms or Couturas from different farms. Another way to say it is that for growers in Nariño, choosing between Castillo and Couture, what they choose to plant may be less important than where they plant it and how they grow it. So, in, G, in the G by E by M framework, M is the least sticky variable. It's the variable that's easiest to change. I can change my management practices between today and tomorrow. It's harder to change my environment, and it's much harder to change genetics, which involves this multi-year process of renovation with new varieties. But I can change my management practices tomorrow. What that says is that growers are committed to Castillo. They're going to continue to grow it. It's going to continue to appear to you in offers, but you can work on it. You can improve management practices in the field. Certainly, you can see there's a lot of room for improvement in selection. And we know that Castillo um, tends to do better when it's harvested at a, at a more mature point, when it's a deeper red. And so we're beginning work uh, on those kinds of harvesting practices in our project. And it's something that the, that the industry, focused on quality, can pursue. And there may be a policy implication there. If, if where I grow my coffee is an important determinant of how good it is, then I should be able to understand better what the potential of my region, my agroecology is for producing cup quality. In Colombia in particular, which has multiple denominations of origin, the region is a denomination of origin, has information on five discrete agroecological zones that have different levels of suitability for producing high quality coffee. That information is important and that will inform growers as to whether they pursue a strategy on their farms of maximizing productivity or seeking to maximize cup quality. And I think it creates this idea that extension services can become more intelligent with time introducing this kind of ecological information. What about Ketura? At the farm, in the policy making, in the, in the marketplace. You saw what's happening in terms of people's preferences with Ketura. If you're planting 18% of your new coffee in Ketura every year, over multiple years, Ketura is going away. Growers are voting against Ketura with their decisions. There's nothing in this, these results that will probably contribute to any changes in terms of policies of rival promotion. So we don't expect any changes there. What about the marketplace? In the March-April issue of Roast Magazine, Ken Davids, the founder of Coffee Review, published an uh, opinion piece called The Geishas and the Rest, in which he ascribed 
uh, different coffee varieties to different quality tiers. As the title suggests, Geisha was in the top tier, along with SL28, Bourbon, Pacas, um, and he assigned Katura, along with other varieties he called traditional Latin American varieties, to the second tier of quality. And he said, these are solid but not spectacular varieties. They are not really appropriate for separation into the kinds of single varietal lots that people are looking for more and more in the marketplace. And I think the message to industry is, there is very little incentive for growers to plant Katura. If you want to continue to source Katura, you need to make a special effort to incentivize that in your purchasing. In the meantime, what do growers say? Growers say, I don't think Katura is going to increase my likelihood of success in quality differentiated segments of the market. And get growers in Nariño now beginning to go out and propagate more traditional varieties. Varieties that are more consistently associated with cup quality to position them for better success in the quality differentiated segment of the market. There's propagation now going on at Bourbon, Aragohipe, and even Geisha in the field. So if you're liking Couture now, but not creating incentives for it, you may find in places like Nariño, in the future you'll be offered Castillo for one of these more traditional cultivars. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michael. So we're ready for the Q&A, and I'd like to see Eddie Hayden's dogs here, up here. Eddie? Eddie? Yeah? Good. And Hubert Posada? And uh, Tim Metalbow? some questions as you may know but uh, I'll just start with some and then maybe you can comment uh, uh, have you looked at the, with the research you've done have you looked at the difference of costs and yields between the two varieties and uh, I mean is, is, is there a significant difference uh, for the farmer in terms of cost and yields so we have looked at the issue of cost um, what we what we found is that there are three different types of growers in Nariño. I think we tend to think about production costs in a kind of blanket way. There is a production cost, and we know that that production cost should be different for different varieties, but we also uh, find that there are different kinds of growers. There are growers who are specialized in coffee, there are diversified growers who, for whom coffee is just a part of their income portfolio, and then there are growers who depend on off-farm income and also dabble in coffee. And each of them has a different level of efficiency, different production costs. So we're able to identify different production costs. Obviously, the specialized grower is more efficient, has the lowest production cost. Um, what we haven't been able to do is to determine uh, the differentiation in terms of production cost by variety. Why? Not because they don't have predict different production costs. If you follow the recommendations of the Federation, and here I'll ask Uwe to compliment, but there is a, there is a series of recommendations uh, attendant to each variety, and if you follow those, you will have different production costs. What we find in nine-tenths of a hectare is that often people, first of all, have their varieties jumbled. We had to work here with, variety, with farmers who had the varietal plots physically separated so that we could ensure traceability and separation throughout the process, but many have them jumbled. And even if they don't have them jumbled, if you have such a small area, people tend to apply the same <coughs> agronomic practices to both varieties. So they have the same production cost for both. It shouldn't be that way, but in the majority of cases, the farmers at this scale, this level of sophistication, it really is. But I know that's different, and I'm sure you have data on what the two varieties cost to produce. Uh, the principal difference between Castillo and, and Caturro is right all the small farmers in Colombia try to, to mix all the varieties, so try to have an idea about the process is a little difficult. But in terms of the production, Castillo basically is 10% or 15% more in production like compared with Caturra. That is one of the principal differences between the two varieties. 
And the other important point is normally when you plant a susceptible variety like Acatura, probably you will have to involve 20% of the cost. It's for the control of the of the weak frost. I think this is the majority of the difference between the two varieties. So the next question then leads to what you mentioned that we should give the farmers incentives if we want to keep Katura. Do you have any idea how much that should be? You should be able to, it should be mathematical, right? So a grower's income depends on three things. How much they produce and how efficiently they produce. Uh, how much they produce, how much they earn for each pound they produce, and what it costs them to produce that coffee. So there are three ways to increase profitability. You reduce the cost, you increase the price point, you increase the total amount of production. Um, the problem with this question, I mean, it's the logical question, right? It's the actionable question. Uh, Maxwell yesterday said, oh, you're raising all these problems about water. Where are the solutions? And so people say, so think, well, you tell me, you know, we need more incentives. What do we need to pay? The issue is you can never calculate what the loss to rust is going to be. One year it may be zero. And I think there are cases where people are achieving similar productivities with Katura as Castillo. When it's really well managed, low incidence of rust is possible. So you may have no trade-off in terms of productivity. Um, but the one year you may lose 75%. And so how do you build that into a consistent buying model where you say, I'm going to give you, Tim Hill from Counterculture has been the most transparent about this, and he said, you know, I'm willing to pay 50 to 60 cents a pound as, a, as an incentive for Castille, for Cattura. But I'm only doing that because it's there. I don't think that my 50, 60 cents a pound as a single buyer committing to that policy is going to keep Cattura in the ground. As long as it's there, I'm willing to pay that difference for it. So in other words, the kind of incentives I'm talking about to keep Katura viable have to come from the whole set. Can't come from the individual buyer. You may keep 12 or 15 or 50 farms in Katura from your incentives, but if everybody doesn't get together and say Katura is valuable to us at a departmental level, at a regional level, we're willing to do that. So I think it's a it's a very complicated question. I'm not trying to evade it, but I think the calculations are difficult because you just never know how big that risk is and how much the loss to us is going to be to be able to build it into us into a risk premium that's stable. Now, do you, you have been involved at least in a couple of extents in Colombia a couple of times. Uh, can you, from memory, remember any of the results? Weren't you there during the when the Castillo won? What was it the year after? Mm. No, I can't really remember that. And um, maybe I'm different from anyone else in here. I don't pay so much attention attention to the varietal I buy. Um, you know, it's it's there, but um, I'm not really paying attention to which varietal I should buy. It's just uh, if I like the coffee or not. Uh, but I was thinking it's like in everything that we do, we need to have a varietal of things. And, um, and I remember last year when we were here, uh, there was a talk about different species of coffee that you know, uh, that, that are not now cultivated for uh, for consumption, but uh, we have to uh, continue looking for different species and holding them because we don't know what's going to happen to our climate. And I'm just wondering if this is happening in other parts of Central America or South America uh, because um, they have a similar kind of species. Or varietals. Um, so, is this problem in other countries, and is the the Katura different in Colombia than in Costa Rica or, or somewhere else? Uh, also, we have a, a some additional question about the, the dynamic of the roast in the, in the Colombia country. The roast is start to attack the coffee plantation in Colombia maybe thirty years ago and all the farmers that were affected basically was the farm that is a low altitude with high temperature and high precipitation of the year. If you see what's going on in Nariño or in the south part of the country, uh, basically the farms are located at high altitude, low temperature, so that means that the, this kind of environment is no, it's no good for uh, the development of the roast. 
but uh, we start to see the increase of the roles in this area in the last five years. So that means that the roles is teach to us is they have a very good adaptation to, the, to all the environmental conditions in Colombia. So we try to, to use and to teach to the farmer, especially small farmers that use uh, long technology, uh, definitely they have to move to, to use so kind of the resistant variety, but varieties that performs equal or similar to the standard variety like Katura or Bonati. I would just want to say one thing, which is that um, I participated in, it was in the 2000, so I think in certain segments of the market, there was some criticism of the way Colombia responded to coffee bean for us with such a strong push behind Castillo, behind a single variety. Um, as I understand it, it represents now more than 40% of Colombia's coffee lands is Castillo in just 10 years' time. That's a significant change. In 2012-13 crop year was when Central America really got hit by coffee leaf rust and I participated in what was called the first international coffee rust summit in Guatemala, emergency summit, and I was facilitating all the work on the social and, the social and economic impacts of coffee leaf rust. And I think at that, in that space there was a, a moment where everybody sort of looked again at Colombia. What did Colombia do beginning in 2008? And there was an incredible appreciation for what was done. In Central America, the institutions were not able to marshal any kind of significant resources to counter coffee leaf rust. And people looked at Colombia, which had the army of yellow shirts, as they call it, uh, which Hoover directs in the extension services. You had a breeding program that was more than 50 years old that had a variety ready to deliver that was resistant to coffee leaf rust and producing significant cup quality. You had ties in with financial institutions that had financial products appropriate to finance farm renovation. It was a holistic, coordinated, massive, ultimately very impressive, systematic response to coffee leaf rust. And it saved Columbia's coffee culture. Uh, and it saved, we kept smallholders viable at a time when they otherwise wouldn't have been viable. I think um, even people who were critical of the initial, initially of the response in Colombia, also sourcing in Central America, and I'm like, wow, what we need here is exactly what Colombia did. And I think that's a really important thing to think about, is that, so, you know, the manifestations of rust, uh, may vary from origin to origin, but in general, what Hoover's talking about is something that we've seen also in Central America. It's just the crisis is that it moved to higher elevations, into regions that we're not familiar with it. Um, the other thing that's really significant is that in 2010, people were coming from Central America to SCAA and giving presentations saying, there are people at 1600 meters talking about this thing on their coffee leaves that they've never seen before. It's called coffee leaf rust. And that was 2010. And then in 2012, they wiped out coffee crops in Central America. People went, we didn't see this coming. Well, Colombia saw it coming and had a ready response and it jumped out. So I think it's, it's really significant what's been, been done. And unfortunately, countries that haven't invested in building institutions in coffee um, are really vulnerable to this. And I think we see it all over Central America now. A quick question to Uber then. Will the Castillo travel to other origins like Central America? Uh, we released Castillo um, 10 years ago and uh, uh, FNC is a private company in Colombia so basically we have a very good relationship with the official government in Colombia uh, and we never uh, certify or protect the varieties but we are starting the last two years to protect the varieties because we know that many of the material is moving to Central America and also is moving to Ecuador and Peru and maybe also some countries uh, in Asia also are planted at this time. We can some of the lines from Castillo variety. So now we protect the varieties so and we are using this kind of strategy in order to, to have the, the right sobre varieties from FNC. And it's something that we are working very hard in the last, the last years in order to, to protect these varieties that move out from Colombia. Yeah, got a question? Uh, is there done anything on a governmental level in Colombia to make farming methods so that they're not hit so bad by coffee leaf us? I mean, we've seen so many times that we are ch uh, chasing new uh, varietals instead of uh, maybe changing the way you are farming your coffee. So. Yeah, it's, it's not bad.
Uh, yeah. uh, one of the strategies for a company and also for the government is uh, the company provides uh, some of the resistant varieties, but also the government was involved in all this project and the government support parts of the management of the crops and also facilitate some kind of the credits or loans for the, for the farmers. So I can see that this was a, a big campaign between government and, the, and FNC in order to change a little the structure of, the, of the, the, the COVID production system in Colombia with the new varieties. You have to also remember that Colombia has 553,000 farmers. So it's very difficult to get to everyone to train them. Uh, they even have a television show every night uh, for coffee. Uh, where you could do some training, but still, I mean, uh, just giving out seeds is so much more efficient. So I think uh, the logical way is just, okay, let's focus on that. And uh, the extension is service. Uh, I mean, the farmer that I work with has never had uh, any training from an extensionist. He knows the extensionist in the area, but has never had training. There's just too many farmers. Um, coming back to your microorganism party from yesterday, uh, I've heard that uh, actually organic farming uh, would actually, you know, that rust is actually a sign that you are stressing the soil, you're stressing the plants, and it's a natural reaction from the plants. I've just heard that, so, so how do you see that, Michael? I'm going to refer to the scientist on that one. <laughs> I, I think um, one of the questions Tim shared that he had prepared was about the environmental impacts of, uh, of, of this. So there are different kinds of trade-offs right, between the two varieties. One is in terms of productivity and risk, uh, and risk in terms of resistance. One is in terms of cup quality. The other one is in terms of environmental impact. So if people are managing the two varieties in different ways, certainly you have to apply to Katura uh, coffee leaf rust control strategy that you don't have to apply to Castillo. Uh, but also, this is the person who, who was the breeder behind Castillo, so he's the authority on it. Um, my understanding is uh, that you know, Castillo was bred for more exposure to sun. Katura is more uh, amigable, more um, compatible with organic production systems than uh, Castillo in the sense that Castillo was bred for sun, which can't be, it was not compatible with an organic system. So um, Tim's sort of premise of his question was, you know, isn't uh, Castillo better for the environment? Because Couture, you have to apply uh, rust control, uh, agro agrochemicals for rust control. The truth is one of the most effective rust controls is a copper sulfate, which is an organic compound. And so, um, and the, the general compatibility of, of uh, Couture with, with organic production systems may make it actually more environmentally stable because the shade canopy that's associated with organic production systems generates all kinds of ecosystem services in terms of soil uh, fertility, soil quality, soil structure, reduction of soil erosion, water quality. So um, I, think, I think the trade-offs are more complex and I'm, as, as a social scientist and a physical scientist, I don't, uh, I don't understand them as well. So maybe you can help us with that. Maybe beginning with the idea of, you know, the, the optimal level of sun exposure for the Castillo derivatives. Uh, the definition of the type of the system, free ray exposition or shade, the bend is more about the environmental condition. You have a very good distribution of the rain across the year, and you have a very good temperature. Probably the, the coffee plant can grow up to free ray exposition. But if you have any constraints about the distribution of the precipitation, or you have high temperature, definitely you have to move the plants with shade. In this kind of the systems, uh, if you plant Katura, probably Katura will be affected in the same intensity like the spray exposition. So in organic projects that use the shade, probably the best idea is to use a Castillo variety because a design try to find uh, uh, inputs to control the, the rows. It's very, it's very difficult in, the, in this kind of approach, the organic projects. But uh, I will explain later probably how is the strategy, how we select the plants according to the environmental condition or according to the different type of the system that you have in Yes, you're on later. I just said, so we need to go for the cupping. I've got one last question from Anna. 
uh, hopefully a short answer so we can move on. First of all, thank you for the amazing work that you've done in the company and in the country. But since we are just a small 2% buying power, and we are all after the exceptional coffees, what would you recommend to buy from Mourinho? What are the um, varietals that produce exceptional taste and exceptional coffees, apart from geisha that we all know? Maybe there are others that are good for the soil and good for the farmers as well, but would it's the coffee from different price range, definitely it's like above ten dollars or something. Thank you. I think what the survey, um, what the research suggested to us is that every cultivar that is in significant production in the Reno, Castillo, Colombia, Catura is still there, there's a significant amount of Catura, there's some Tipica, um, there's a small amount of Maragotipe, um, are all people producing exceptional qualities. The median elevation in Nourinho in our project is 1950 meters. It's exceptionally high grown coffee. Um, the conditions are optimal. Um, everything is capable of producing high quality. Really, to me, it's less about the varietals um, than it is about sort of the political economy of coffee in Nourinho. Nourinho's coffee sector is set up to serve those two large supply chains, and it doesn't have to be. There just hasn't been a market channel that's been reliable enough to move more than 2% of the region's coffee into higher value channels. But there's more coffee <coughs> available in Nourinho there. Our whole project is set up to try to build reliable systems to move from 2% to 5% to 8% to maybe 10% uh, because we think there's enough quality coffee there to satisfy that much demand. It's just that the market channels haven't been built for it. So it's not about varieties, it's about building the systems to bring that coffee to market people like you were looking for. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you.